Welcome, everyone. Uh, yes, this seems to work. <laughs> Great. I'm Cathy Gotardo, Martina Luza Curator of Drawings uh, at the Courtauld. And as you know, this lecture is part of the Frank Davis Memorial Lecture Series, an annual distinguished series of lectures that was um, established in honor of Frank Davis, a critic of Country Life magazine, through a bequest from the Fred Morgan Kirby Foundation. So coinciding with the current major exhibition, Fusely and the Modern Woman, Fashion, Fantasy and Fetishism, which is at the Courtauld Gallery um, and which I co-curated with Professor David Emeritus David Solkin, who is uh, in the room here with us, uh, exhibition which runs until the 8th of January. This year's lectures offer a platform for new perspectives on one of the most original and idiosyncratic of 18th century European artists. A central, central concern for all the speakers will be, or was also, Fusely's graphic treatment of the human figure, how his draftsmanship builds the body as an excessively expressive signifier, one which is equipped to communicate the bizarre and often highly erotic narratives that their author deployed to construct and promote his self-consciously singular brand. In the process, Fusely's bodies expose the classical tradition to the prospect of its own disintegration under the unbearable pressures exerted by the advent of modernity. The next lecture in this series will take place next Tuesday, the 6th of December, and its title, Fusely's is, in, the title is Fusely's Mutable Bodies and will be delivered by Dr. Martin Myron, uh, Head of Grants and Fellowships and Networks at the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art. Tonight's lecture will be given by Dr. Sarah Carter, who holds a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and the Fonds de Recherche du Québec, where she is pursuing a project entitled Empire Follows Art, Trafficking Culture in Imperial Britain, 1780-1830. Sarah completed her PhD at McGill University just last week, in fact. <laughs> she's Dr. Carter, or she's been Dr. Carter for a week now, so congratulations. <laughs> And her dissertation research explored the reception of erotic antiquity in Harry Fusley's various circles. The title of our lecture tonight is The Art of Thinking Through Collaboration, Fusley, Blake, and Darwin. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you to the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, and thank you to um, both Ketty and David for inviting me um, to speak in this lecture series. It's really an honor to be speaking, um, especially in this particular lineup, which um, is all scholars I, whose work I, I deeply admire. Um, so as, uh, oh, can, you, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. wonderful. Um, so as Kenny mentioned, this particular project comes out of my uh, doctoral dissertation, which is entitled Art Eros um, and the British Enlightenment. During the 1790s, under the aegis of radical publisher Joseph Johnson, painter draftsman theorist Henry Fuseli, yeah, no worries. That's, is that, everyone can hear me okay? <laughs> painter draftsman theorist Henry Fuseli and painter engraver poet William Blake worked together to produce Fertilization of Egypt and Tornado, a pair of daring engravings for Erasmus Darwin's The Botanic Garden, a poem published in several editions between 1792 and 1799. But these images are more than just illustrations turning from faithful delivery of their source material toward polymorphous association, Fuseli and Blake engaged in their own collaborative mythopoeia, or myth-making, rivaling Darwin's authorial voice. The first aim of this lecture is to explore the working relationship that produced these images, an approach that enriches our understanding of the manifold frameworks that gave them generative 
force, that is, their ability to evoke a complex network of associations in the mind of the viewer. However, focusing critical attention on collaboration likewise reveals the imprint of marketplace pressures in new, peculiar ways. A closer look at the intimate internal life of the publishing industry, its working realities, reveals that collaboration was perhaps, perhaps less a fertile cross-pollination between like minds than a forced coupling. This lecture has a twofold structure. I will begin with what we might conceptualize as the favorable side of collaboration, a point of view that allows us to see the productivity that alliances in the publishing sector facilitated. And in the second half of the lecture, I will explore the dark side of collaboration, its limitations and inequalities. Turning from works like Fertilization of Egypt to a series of drawings that Fuseli made between 1799 and 1810, I will argue that the bold ancient virility that is first realized but later frustrated across this selection of works speaks to the same economic climate that brought Fuseli, Blake, and Darwin into a professional partnership. We will see the role reversals between authors, painters, and engravers that took place in the publishing industry mirrored in these drawings. Here, the potent eroticism of the ancients is used to call attention to the so-called emasculating effects of commercial society. A little bit about the Botanic Garden. Um, it is a tour de force of erudition. It contains a pair of distinct poems, the economy of vegetation, and the love of the plants. The latter uses Linnaean classes to describe the sexual reproduction of flowers, while the former combines discursive footnotes with poetry to survey recent developments in botany, physics, chemistry, natural history, and comparative religion. In addition to its dual poems, the volume also featured the impressive set of engravings that we have already met with. This evening, I will consider one of these plates in detail, Fertilization of Egypt. It is of particular interest because it allows us to investigate Blake's working relationship with Fuseli in his role as reproductive engraver. Consider this pairing of drawings preserved in the British Museum. On the left is the preliminary pencil sketch that Fuseli delivered to Blake to indicate the basic design, while the wash drawing on the right belongs to Blake and elaborates the details in preparation for the final engraving. In both, a monumental god is shown from behind, straddling the banks of the Nile River, which flows between his muscular legs. His powerful triangular stance acts to frame a second figure, transformed by Blake from a faint outline into an aged man who glides toward us on spread wings. Water flows from his extended arms and cascading beard, while lightning sparks from his fingertips. But while Blake has added much of the detail, the inscription printed below the final engraved image suggests that Blake simply mediated the intellectual property of his colleague. It reads H. Fuseli R.A. I.N.V., which is short for invent invented or invented, and W. Blake S.C., short for sculpted or engraved. Supported, however, by the evidence at hand, Blake scholars have been tempted to overturn these designations to substantiate, for example, compelling comparisons between the bearded rain god gliding toward the viewer and Urizen, Blake's despotic god of reason. Building on this resistance to name Fuseli, or indeed even Blake, as the dominant hand, I propose that we do away with attribution altogether at least momentarily. Instead, I ask, what do we see when we embrace authorial confusion? And what I venture is this. 
we become attentive to the role of the image as a juncture, a space where different ideas concerning ancient material culture, mythology, and sexuality compete and converge. Fertilization of Egypt is exemplary because in addition to precluding a conventional division of labor between designer and engraver, the image itself resists its role as pictorial embellishment inside the botanic garden. That is, it functions as an autonomous statement that while responding to the verse, nonetheless makes claims of its own. We can appreciate these unique claims by looking at the poem. The image is prompted by the following passage from Darwin, and you can read the poem across the pages here. Sailing in air when dark monsoon enshrouds his tropic mountains in a night of clouds, or drawn by whirlwinds from the line returns and showers over Afrik all his thousand urns, high over his head the beams of Sirius glow and dog of Nile Anubis barks below. The engraving duplicates the personification found in the verse, a choice well suited to both Fusilli and Blake, each of whom were known for their ability to express abstract ideas through the human body. Here, the annual flooding of the Nile is given animal human form as the Egyptian god Anubis, a move which following Darwin's model cleverly weds nature and culture. Darwin, for example, elaborates his verse with a discursive footnote, and you can also see that um, at the bottom of the page, which details the timing of the summer monsoons in Africa. Citing the comparative mythographer Abbe Puch, Darwin explains how Anubis came to be associated with this natural phenomenon, the flooding of the Nile. In ancient Egypt, his image was hung on temples to warn the populace of the rising flood water, which coincided with the appearance of the god's celestial counterpart, the dog star Sirius. These citations, however, are far from neutral. They point to contested sites of negotiation in Enlightenment scholarship, and Blake and Fusilli confront the complexity of those debates in their design. Consider, for example, the representation of material culture. In his initial sketch, Fusilli concentrates on the musculature of the figure, the canine head, and the star above. However, another element, albeit very faint, vies for our attention as well. Overlapping with Anubis's right foot, it is just possible to discern the outline of a sistrum, a musical instrument associated with ritual practice in ancient Egypt. While given no more attention than the other perfunctory contextual details on the sheet's recto, such as the pyramids, this sketchy triangular formation at left, the verso offers a detailed rendering of the musical device. Here, the rattle occupies the same position as its counterpart on the opposite side of the page, superimposed over the outline of the foot, which is visible through the paper. As Caddy's excellent essay in the exhibition catalog demonstrates, this is a technique that Fusilli used often. And its intriguing presence here prompts several questions. Why was so much care lavished on this singular detail, one that is not notably absent from Darwin's text? Fusilli and Blake were likely drawing from comparative mythographers writing in the 18th century as was Darwin, who in turn were drawing from classical authors. Plutarch's Moralia is commonly cited in period literature for its account of the sistrum. Plutarch explains that the curious rattle was an attribute of the ancient goddess Isis, and that its combination of motion and sound was thought to nullify the violent wind and volcanic clamor of Typhon a Greek god identified with Set, the Egyptian deity of chaos and storms. 
Servius, yet another familiar ancient authority on the artifact, connects it explicitly to Isis and the power to move water. Isis is the genius of Egypt, he writes, who by the movement of her sistrum, which she carries in her right hand, signifies the access and recess of the Nile. In the print, Fusilli and Blake contextualize the sistrum within a sonorous ritual practice that highlights these relationships. With the sistrum close at hand, Anubis readies himself to challenge the oncoming monsoon, an embodied force of nature. He will use the sistrum to combat Typhon, or otherwise call upon Isis's power to control the Nile. But in addition to creating an intertextual dialogue with emerging scholarship on ancient mythology, Fusilli and Blake likewise recall their second collaboration for the Botanic Garden. The thunderous violence of fertilization of Egypt is mirrored in Tornado. This plate depicts Zeus and Typhon manifesting the same powers of wind, rain, and lightning. Both plates thus concern syncretic gods and primordial worlds shaped by opposing forces. These forces are, of course, elemental, but they are also distinctly gendered. That is, if the sistrum recalls Isis and the passive powers of generation with which she was associated in the ancient world, the instrument becomes an emblem of the feminine and thus a complement to the Anubian virility that dominates the design. That the instrument appears on the verso of Fusilli's preliminary sketch enhances this diametrical opposition or sacred dualism. In fact, one compelling way to approach the sistrum delineated on the verso is to apprehend it as a ghostly effect. That is, an image, to borrow a phrase from Shira Brisman, that lingers as an apparition in rear view, faint but attached. Interpreted thus, the dualistic relationship between feminine and masculine power, as conceptualized in antiquity, is realized by the clever use of the page. Brimming with erotic potential, the image also conflates procreative acts. The focal point of the image is the god's loincloth, just sheer enough to reveal the contours of the upper thigh and glute. While we see the Nile streaming toward us between parted legs, the pose and the title of the engraving invite us to envision the fertile waters as seminal fluid streaming from the male figure. Heroic virility of the kind imagined here was a potent theme for Fusilli, and Blake for that matter, who mobilized it as a visual idiom for creative genius. This association of ideas is well articulated by one of Fusilli's critics. As the Reverend R. A. Bromley put it, Fusilli's art produced that which is not of our acquaintance, but of a new creation. In so doing, he became a libertine of painting, arrogantly fashioning himself as a great creator, and therefore someone who had no need of models fashioned by a Christian divinity. It is, I think, a pertinent critique when considered alongside fertilization of Egypt, for it accuses the artist and by extension, Blake, the engraver, of usurping the authority of the original, in this case, not only God or nature, but also Darwin as the author of the book. The image registers a shared interest in eroticism and antiquity, but both Fusilli and Blake depart from their respective models to add something of their own. Of course, the botanic garden embraced such flights of fancy with its congeniality between makers, images, and ideas. The book became a breeding ground for the kind of ingenuity that disgruntled uh, prosaic critics like Bromley. The species of collaboration can also be found in a second print that Fusilli and Blake made together and around the same time as well. 
This is Allegory of a Dream of Love, or the title that I prefer is Falsa an Coelum. This etching contains no inscription detailing a division of labor, but scholars think that Blake must have etched it or otherwise Fusilli and Blake working together. Not only was it made during a moment of intense collaboration, but it only exists as a singular print, so there's just one of these. A fact that suggests it might have been made in a moment of print shop experimentation. It depicts a nude, unconscious woman, partially reclined, her arms draped listless over plush cushions. A pair of armed cherubs make their escape at left, while a third lingers, poised to loose his arrow between the woman's parted legs. There, a butterfly perches with spread wings, casting a deep shadow on her partially concealed labia. Insulating this strange tableau from the waking world glimpsed uh, through the window at left, a curtain hangs across the room. A male herm stands erect, encased within its folds, pressing his right index finger to closed lips. Drawn across gleaming white skin, the eye follows the extended arm of the sleeper toward an elephantine creature. It points a muscular arm and serpentine trunk at an inscription printed in capital letters on the floor. Falsa ad coelum mitten insomnia manes. So what are we to make of this complex composition, rich in learned illusion and undisguised eroticism? Our first clue is the quotation from Virgil, a line from the sixth book of the Aeneid, which concludes the following passage. To gates the silent house of sleep adorn, of polished ivory this, that of transparent horn. True visions through transparent horn arise, through polished ivory pass deluding lies. The verse explains an architectural feature peculiar to the underworld, the gates of sleep. These dual passages buried spirits and dreams between worlds. The ivory gate was that through which the immortal souls that inhabit the underworld sent falsa insomnia or false dreams to the living. The other, constructed of horn, was the gate through which dead souls transmitted truths. The line was highly controversial in the 18th century. The main problem was a contradiction in the text. The hero of the story, Aeneas, travels between the worlds of the living and the dead via the gate of false dreams, but bearing a true prophecy. According to Edward Gibbon, line 896 was profoundly troubling. He writes, Virgil explained away his hero's descent into an idle dream. More recently, scholars have embraced this ending. No longer an act of literary vandalism, as Gibbon might have it, the line has been reinscribed as a tantalizing enigma, a succulent bit of candy for those who delight in riddles. I suggest that Fusilli and Blake were similarly drawn to the possibility of manifold interpretations. In fact, I would argue that the etching performs a similar role as the ponderous line it quotes, as one such idle dream it is a visual conundrum, an enigma, one that invites viewers to exercise their imaginations and engage with active, open minds. We can turn to Blake to better understand how this image operates. In 1799, spurning his patron's wish to see all fancy emitted from his work, Blake theorized the power of imagination in life and art. To me, this world is all one continued vision of fancy or imagination, and I feel flattered when I am told so. What is it, sets Homer, Virgil, and Milton in so high a rank of art? Why is the Bible more entertaining and instructive than any other book? 
Is it not because they are addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation, and but immediately to the understanding or reason? Such is true painting, and such was alone valued by the Greeks and the best modern artists. True painting, like epic poetry, Blake insisted, moved the viewer by way of the imagination. But what exactly one saw in one's mind's eye when reading Virgil, for example, depended on his nature. As a man is, so he sees, declared Blake in the same letter to his skeptical correspondent, the Reverend Dr. John Trussler. The imaginative eye of the wise man or the poet would see more of reality in everything than the fool. If Blake takes up a complex question, he arrives at a rather simple answer. Imagination is not only integral to the creation of images, but to the interpretation of them as well. While scholars have described Blake as a myth maker, challenging the reader viewers of his illuminated books to create meaning, this mode of engagement is also crucial to understanding the images that he created in collaboration with Fuseli. The question then is not how should we interpret the image definitively, but rather which path should we follow first? Perhaps the most enticing and the only one that I have time to consider this evening is that which leads us deeper into Virgil's Aeneid. Exploring the adverse effects of desire Balsa ad Coelum recalls an episode in the epic when Dido, the heroine, the queen of Carthage, suffers insomnia or restless dreams as a side effect of her intense yearning for her depart departed lover, Aeneas, again the hero of the story. The troubled sleeping figure in the engraving or, um, embodies the same emotional exhaustion that Dido experiences in the narrative. She lies exposed and uncomfortable on the bed, with her head straining at the neck and limbs hanging languidly. In addition to the erotic implications of her fatigued form, which Fuseli and Blake have laid unscrupulously bare to the viewer, the heart emblem at her waist and the carefully aimed phallic-shaped arrow all point to an erotic affliction of the sleeping mind. In the light of day, Dido will wake to the revelation that her nightmare was but a hollow fantasy, an idle dream, the same, or the product of the same burning passion for Aeneas that will later lead her um, to rave around the city like a frenzied bacchant. Supporting my claim that Falsa Ad Coelum explores the adverse effects of sexual desire on mind and body, the preparatory oil sketch for an earlier Dido painting by Fuseli, and you can see um, the finished canvas here at right, uh, gives us a view toward the erotic origins of Dido's tragic suicide. Fuseli depicts Dido in the moment after she has taken her own life, having realized that her lover Aeneas has betrayed her and will leave Carthage to go found Rome. In the oil sketch, as in the drawing for fertilization of Egypt, Fuseli exploits his medium by creating a seductive discourse between recto and verso. On one side, on this side, Dido succumbs to the torments of spurned love. But on the other side, we find a pair of bodies engaged in sexual intercourse. Here too, Fuseli nurtures a rapport between opposing sides of the same sheet. Held up to the light, we can visually penetrate the paper to enter into Dido's mind and see the reason behind her anguish. Together, the finished painting and its preparatory drawing stage the psychological consequences of repressed desire. Returning to Falsa Ad Coelum with this intertextual discourse in mind, we become attentive to the fact that it summons us to explore less familiar regions of art, those which follow from sexual desire, dreaming, and madness. 
run through these ideas, we can appreciate the extent to which Fuseli and Blake pursued a new, unbridled art of the imagination. Both Fertilization of Egypt and Falsa Ad Coelum rivaled their source material. Blake and Fuseli challenged Darwin and Virgil, borrowing from them to craft new myths, ones which resonated with their shared interests. Thinking through collaboration allows us to approach these images as intended, as invitations to participate in collaborative mythopoesis or mythmaking. But as I gestured to at the beginning of this talk, collaboration, while productive, was not always advantageous. Both fertilization of Egypt and falsa ad coelum also need to be contextualized within the commercial milieu of the 1790s. The print trade was not an impassive marketplace to be easily circumnavigated. Rather, as Blake conceptualized it, it was as unpredictable and perilous as the ocean. When read through an economic lens, the professional alliance that brought the botanic garden into being appears less as a favorable synergy than a capitalist innovation forced upon the poet, the painter, and the engraver under the authority of Joseph Johnson, who again is the publisher. Fuseli here offers our starting point. In a lecture entitled The Present State of the Art and the Causes Which Check Its Progress, which he delivered for the first time in 1820, he boldly declared a failure to address the precarious state of modern British art. He ruminated gloomily on the prospects for the future when compared to the sheer productivity of the past. He writes, Florence, Bologna, Venice, each singly taken, produced in the course of the 16th century alone more great historic pictures than all Britain taken together from its earliest attempts to its present efforts. What are we to conclude from this? That the soil from which Shakespeare and Milton sprang is unfit to rear the genius of poetic art, or find the cause of the seeming impotence in that general change of habits, customs, pursuits, and amusements for near a century has stamped the national character of Europe with apathy or discountenance of the genuine principles of art? The final question is rhetorical. The cause of art, uh, of artistic decline, here crucially framed as a lack of virility or impotence, was a want of patrons that valued the highest form of artistic expression, poetical painting. One source of disillusionment that colors this academy lecture was likely Fusley's own failed ambition to navigate the marketplace and unite art and commerce with his Milton Gallery. Modeled on Boydell's Shakespeare Gallery, with which he had been involved as a painter, Fuseli schemed to establish his own literary gallery in 1790. Based on John Milton's works, it was devised to achieve the same dual goals as its models. That is, it was a means to promote British literature in an ambitious visual format, while providing a commercial space to sell catalogs, paintings, and prints. And you can see here on the slide um, an example for uh, uh, the Shakespeare Gallery, and then as well its derivative uh, print, which would have been sold um, through the exhibition. The project was no small undertaking, but Fuseli stressed the necessity for bold action, for amidst competition in London, market forces dictated that the painter needed to also assume the role of the printer if he hoped for any financial success. Fuseli had learned firsthand that engravings of paintings could generate far more money than originals. The publisher J.R. Smith had made a whopping 500 pounds on selling prints of Fuseli's most popular work, here, The Nightmare, um, which he sold for small sums to many consumers. And this was compared to the meager 20 pounds that Fuseli earned for the original painting. 
It is in this economic climate that we should contextualize um, the Milton Gallery. It would foil a division of labor that saw print sellers take an unfair share of industry profits. It would also grant Fuseli more control over the quality and reception of his work since he proposed to execute the engravings himself. He began training in different reproductive techniques as early as 1786. But in spite of these diligent efforts to pinch pennies and banish middlemen, the Milton Gallery was not as lucrative as Fuseli hoped. Writing much earlier, Darwin engaged in similar strategic marketplace tactics. He would pursue the same growing desire for fashionable pictures that had inspired Fuseli to launch his Milton Gallery. In fact, Darwin likened his poem, The Botanic Garden, to a literary picture gallery, not unlike that of Boydell. And you can see here um, a visualization of Boydell's Shakespeare Gallery. In addition to declaring himself a flower painter in one of the three interludes of his poem, Darwin routinely stressed the visuality of his poetry by invoking a picture of Poesis, the argument that poetry and painting resemble one another. Enticing buyers with his own version of a picture gallery, Darwin aspired to achieve the same entrepreneurial success as Boydell, just as Fuseli would attempt in the 1790s. In response to market pressures, the poet had to assume the role of a visual artist. He did so not only via his own lyrical paintings comprised of picturesque language, but also in his recruitment of engraved imagery, a necessary form of advertising. So that would be the plates that Fuseli and Blake made. Turning to Blake, so Blake was likewise compelled to adopt a new role in this economic climate. Fuseli may have taken up engraving and etching on occasion, but Blake spent most of his career as a commercial engraver. And the book trade in particular, Blake's bread and butter, was decidedly disadvantageous to the journeyman. As Joseph Byrne has shown, it operated according to the unrelenting mechanics of rationalization, in which the division of labor was detrimental to both financial um, security and creativity, with each worker having his small role to play in a larger operation, which was mostly profitable for the publishers. Blake nonetheless found ways to resist these rigid hierarchies. He increased his agency, for example, by becoming the designer, engraver, and likely printer of the illustrations for Edward, Young, Edward Young's Night Thoughts. This must have offered Blake some respite initially, since, as he put it, to engrave after another painter is infinitely more laborious than to engrave one's own inventions. Night Thoughts, however, met with the same cool disinterest as the Milton Gallery. Both were among the commercial ventures that, like the Botanic Garden, rushed to capitalize on the demand for illustrated books, which followed from the literary galleries and their associated publications. However, of the three, only the Botanic Garden sold well. And as dictated by industry standards, the rewards were not evenly distributed among contributors. Darwin is said to have earned 10 shillings a line for uh, part two and upwards of 1,000 pounds for part one. Blake's remuneration was modest in comparison. He received just 26 pounds for each of his engravings. It is perhaps because of these inequalities and his inability to make his own visual statements to a viewing public that Blake would become a poet, albeit of a different kind than Darwin. For Blake, the poet or, or bard was a speaker of forgotten truths, someone who was called to reinvigorate the world through his art. That Blake would likewise circumvent the limitations of his medium to do so innovating a new form of printmaking that could combine verse and image on the same sheet of paper 
This is his illuminated printing technique. It signals a similar drive to reform an industry which, as it stood, precluded the voice of the reproductive engraver. Being attentive to these disparities and the professional choices that they gave rise to allows us to see the botanic garden in a new light. The book is the material setting not only for innovative ideas and forms, but also for the division of labor that structured the publishing world. While I have argued that the engravings are equal in terms of their artistic and intellectual import, the same cannot be said of the labor which brought them into being. As such, we might consider whether the collaboration behind the botanic garden resonates with the virile ingenuity promised in fertilization of Egypt or the tempestuous struggle envisioned in Tornado. In the time remaining, I would like to bring the reality of these the reality of this commercial culture into conversation with a group of drawings that Fuseli made between 1799 and 1810. I argue that these drawings function as allegories of modernity and speak to those same market conditions which saw Fuseli, Blake, and Darwin not only work together but assume each other's roles. According to Fuseli, the want of support for high art from the British public was a side effect of compounding cultural pressures, the expansion of modern globalized commerce, and a growing emphasis placed on the individual, someone who had come to place their private interests above the public interest which was now invisible to them. Fuseli would connect this idea directly to bourgeois domesticity. The ambition, activity, and spirit of public life is shrunk to the minute detail of domestic arrangements. We can explore this proposition in Fuseli's drawings, for the same determinism that permeates his writings also finds expression in his graphic work. Fuseli returns to themes of eroticized ancient ritual and devotional practice in a pair of drawings of modern women. Here, the power of divine creation is recognized through the passive act of wearing phallic emblems. On the left, a woman modeled on Fuseli's wife, Sophia, dons a whimsical hairstyle of tight curls drawn together to resemble something like bunched asparagus. She is shown peering coyly at the viewer, wearing bracelets that match her belt, which is decorated with a linear pattern of penises. The figure on the right, who also resembles Sophia, is wearing a robe a la grecque, lowered to expose her breasts and signify her status as a courtesan. She also wears an armband decorated with a phallus in the shape of a pointed arrow. It transforms her ensemble into an exalted expression of neoclassical fashion. Together, these adornments resemble in their simplicity actual artifacts in the collection of the British Museum. For example, this Roman charm ring wrought in gold, which similarly features a schematic penis in relief. This artifact would have been familiar, at least as a type, to period collectors. But these were also the same kinds of artifacts described in contemporary works of comparative religion, which we have already seen Fuseli engaging with. He may have drawn his inspiration um, directly from a work like Knight's Discourse on the Worship of Priapus, which had been circulating outside of its initial exclusive readership since 1794. In probably the most disingenuous passage in the book, Knight explains the gendered practice of wearing priapic charms. He writes, the great characteristic attribute was represented by the organ of generation in that state of tension and rigidity which is necessary to the due performance of its functions. Many small images of this kind have been found among the ruins of Herculaneum and Pompeii, attached to the bracelets which the chaste and pious matrons of antiquity wore round their necks and arms. 
In these, the organ of generation appears alone or only accompanied with the wings of incubation in order to show that the devout wearer devoted herself wholly and solely to procreation, the great end for which she was ordained. However, although the women in Fusley's drawings flaunt phallic insignia, they are no more pious matrons than the female votaries described ironically by night. Rather, as modish modern women, they are better interpreted as elite consumers, promenading as maenads. Women who float devotion, flout devotion to a higher power and commit themselves to fashion. Fusley transforms these women into modern emblems of corrupt modernity. We can explore this idea further in a second drawing, one which allows us to revisit the heroic virility first imagined in the Blake Fusley plates published in the Botanic Garden. Hephaestus, Baia, and Crato securing Prometheus on Mount Caucasus recalls the compositional structure of the much earlier fertilization of Egypt. Here, however, the male hero is a passive character. Fusely depicts Prometheus bound. Prometheus, it should be noted, was a powerful figure in the British imaginary in this period, an emblem of daring ingenuity. In Aeschylus' tragedy, Prometheus Bound, Prometheus gives fire stolen from the tyrant Zeus to humanity in an act of defiance that results in his confinement and torture, but which facilitates enlightenment. A deliverer of the uh, celestial flame by way of rebellion, a metaphor for creativity, Prometheus became a particularly potent trope for practicing artists. In the present drawing, Fusilli visualizes the opening scene of the drama. Hephaestus, god of metal and fire, arrives to punish the disobedient Prometheus. Together with his accomplices, Baia and Crato, feminine personifications of force and strength <coughs> respectively, Hephaestus will begrudgingly nail the troublemaker down. Equivalent to Anubis, he raises his hands above his head, ready to unleash a brutal blow. Meanwhile, Crato and Baia play more passive roles. Crato restrains the captive's right arm, while Baia crouches tenderly over his splayed body to position a stake at the center of his chest. The eye comes to rest on the rock hammer poised to realize the final penetrative act. This drawing is faithful to Aeschylus. The moving with the emphasis on infidelity and transformation of source materials that we have been tracing thus far, I will introduce what I suggest is a variant of this scene. Fusilli reimagines the final penetrative act, so to speak, in this pen and ink wash drawing, three women and a recumbent man, which is uh, in the show. Here, three muscular women eagerly engage in various sexual acts with an anonymous male figure, his face obscured between thighs. The nudity of the women is fantastically counterbalanced against their highly elaborate hair, comprising twisting braids, tight curls, combs, pins, and ribbons. As in Falsa Ad Coelum, the inscription scrawled below the action provides a clue to interpretation. Written in Greek, it translates to, may love thus come upon my enemies. Crucially, the line is also from Prometheus Bound. It references the mass murder of the lustful men of Argos, who conspired to capture and make brides of their unwilling female cousins. Under the cover of night, the maidens slay their prospective husbands to avenge attempted rape. While ambiguous, the drawing confirms what the inscription only hints at, that the love Prometheus wishes upon his enemies is fatal. Executed around the same time as Bio, Crato, and Hephaestus securing Prometheus, I suggest that it visualizes the demise of the Titan 
in explicitly modern terms. These women are Crato, Baia, and Hephaestus, transformed through the lens of sadomasochistic fantasy into contemporary women. But what exactly is going on in three women and a recumbent man? Well, the male figure is, like Prometheus, confined. What is unsettling is the obscurity of the action that takes place buried between the legs of the rightmost female figure. He may be performing oral sex, but other visual clues suggest that he is actually being smothered by his overzealous sexual partner. The dramatic arch of his back may indicate a last desperate gasp for air, um, while his listless legs foreshadow the outcome of the struggle. Increasing the claustrophobic feeling of this sparse interior, the Michelangelesque bodies of the women fill the room to the point of rupture. The left arm of the female figure at right extends to the very edge of the picture plane, threatening to penetrate into our space. As viewers, we can almost feel the oppressive weight of flesh and velvet. Of course, the curtains also serve to frame the scene and lend theatricality to this bedroom turned stage set. As a remake of Aeschylus's tragic drama, Fuseli embraces the aside, placing the death scene in full view. The concept of reversal is also fundamental to understanding the power of this image. The passive force becomes the active and vice versa. Three women and a recumbent man upsets conventional gender roles by positioning women on top. It is perhaps redundant to note that this reversal is not a feminist statement, but a pessimistic allegory addressed to the intellectual powers, to borrow another phrase from Blake. It is an allegory of modernity and the fullest expression of its feminine excess. Reading the male figure as Prometheus summons us to speculate on the forces that administer his subjugation. Fuseli substitutes personification, personifications of strength and force for those of effeminate excess and luxuriant demand, understood to govern the free market economy. I would venture that these are the same women who transform devotional artifacts associated with ancient eros into fashionable accessories. Seen thus, the drawing is a fatalistic commentary on the future of the Promethean artist, who faces oppression, if not complete obliteration, under the heavy weight of modernity, here visualized as attractive female consumers. Thus, what I offer of these drawings is um, that they're a critical commentary on cultural erosion under the influence of commerce, which hollowed out neoclassicism by placing undue emphasis on surface over substance and transforming, as Vicki Coltman has put it, programs of thought or ancient philosophy into material possessions. In the drawings discussed, ancient virility may have been equated with original invention, but it was ultimately bound with Prometheus. Pushing this binding analogy a little further, Fuseli, Blake, and Darwin were similarly bound together in the pages of the Botanic Garden by Joseph Johnson at his publishing house in uh, St. Paul's Churchyard. But as I have argued this evening, while the collaborative labor behind the Botanic Garden produced extraordinary results, it is perhaps best conceptualized not as a happy copulation, to borrow from Blake once more, but rather an uncomfortable menage a cat, a reality that Fuseli gives full expression to in a work like Three Women and a Recumbent Man. Thank you.